Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Welcome to our Red Table Talk, which is a discussion on China-Africa relations. My name is Mary Kamau, and I am the president and co-founder of Nubia International Sorority Incorporated, which is the host of this event alongside the Knights Fraternity Incorporated, which is um, represented by Toyosi, Shemi, and Toby, who will be introduced later on. Uh, we also have the Chinese Cultural Club, which is represented by Tyler Smith and Ashley Talsana, who's also representing Nubia. And then lastly, we have the Center for African Studies represented by Renee and Dr. Mnyandu and Dr. Plummer. So thank you everybody and welcome. Thank you, thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Ashley Tusana, a graduating senior international affairs, economics and Chinese minor from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I'm here representing Chinese Culture Club. I'm the president for this uh, school year and last school year. I'm here with Tyler Smith. So it's a blessing to be here uh, during this time to speak on such a, like an amazing topic. Uh, first of all, welcome to Howard University's first ever, ever Red Table Talk. Um, as a student representing Nubia International Sorority Incorporated and Chinese Culture Club, I'm honored to work with the Knights Fraternity Incorporated Center for African Studies on this event. Um, of course, we are most proud to know that you are all taking the initiative to learn about the world around you and how you can take action while being an undergrad or a graduate student on campus or virtually, and most importantly, holding and sharing these values after graduation when you move on to represent Howard University to the world. Most of you have been learning about Africa from the standpoint of their colonial relations and independence from Western or European countries. However, we wanted to take this time to explore the relationships between Africa and the countries of the East, specifically with the age old relationship found between China and Africa. We crafted this event as an intimate setting or de debriefing to discuss Sino-African relations as students of the diaspora, looking to understand current international events improve the world of development processes, or promote ethical trade relations. All of course, through constructive discourse. With no further ado, I'd like to open the floor to our next speakers who will begin by introducing our lovely panelists. Yes, so for our event today, we'll be having three panelists and we're gonna read their biographies. So the first person is Shemi, and then we have Dr. Piwo um, Nyandu, and then Dr. Plummer will be Sorry, we'll be reading the biographies and then we'll have a summary of Africa slash China relations from Dr. Anita Plummer. So before we do all of that, just by the way, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll address them later on. I will be introducing the first panelist who is Shemi Lore Olatunde. And Shemi Lore Olatunde is a graduating senior biology and economics double major from Lagos, Nigeria. He currently serves as the president of the Knights Fraternity Incorporated and the Howard University African Business Club. He also serves as a mentor to various students through the African Students Association Mentorship Program, HU International Pals, and Mentoring, mentoring Youth and Teens Health, the MIT program. Shemilore is passionate about healthcare, policy, and the economic development of the African continent. He is the co-founder of the Lumen Institute a student-led think tank that focuses on Nigerian issues and the co-convener of Four Africans by Africans, a forum for discussing development on the continent. Shemilore is an emerging leader fellow, fellow, fellow with the United Nations Association and a fellow, fellow at the Clinton Global Initiative. Post-graduation, he plans to work at McKinsey and Company, focusing on global health consulting. Shemilore enjoys good music, insightful discussions, and adventures with friends. Welcome me, welcome me, oh, sorry. <laughs> Help me in welcoming, welcoming um, Shemilore, please. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, Mary. I'm happy to be here, and I'm really excited to learn from, you know, Dr. Anita, Dr. Ploma, um, Dr. Miandu, and, you know, everyone here, and I'm excited to also contribute to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Shemilore. Well, our next panelist is Dr. Pio Kule Miandu. Now, Dr. Miandu was born and raised in Durban, South Africa. He holds a joint lectureship position in the Department of African Studies 
as well as the world languages and culture departments at Howard University. He also consults various government departments on the issue of language and culture. His research interests include Africa-China relations, you know, especially South Africa-China relations, transregionalism, academic diplomacy, and the Zulu language and its global growth. He's a co-founder of Zulunomics, a platform for integrating tech systems in the Zulu language. He's interested in the intersection of Zulu and AI, artificial intelligence, and how he's been involved in recent projects involving machine learning. He's also a creator of the Zulunomics app, the first Zulu app by a native speaker. His other books include a co-edited co work called Pan-African Spaces, Essays in Black Transnationalism, as well as forthcoming monograph, South Africa-China Relations Between Aspiration and Reality in a New Global Order. He's married and has three beautiful children. Thank you for being here, Dr. Miyandi. Let's see if I'm muted or not. Thank you, I'm not. <laughs> Thank you very much. I thought uh, uh, Dr. Blamo was supposed to go first. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll introduce her and then she'll go first. Okay, thank you. Um, we are excited to um, introduce to you Dr. Anita Plummer. Uh, Dr. Anita Plummer is an assistant professor of African studies at Howard University. Her research and teaching focus is on African political economy, transnationalism, public diplomacy, and Sino-African relations. Before joining the faculty at Howard University, she taught international studies at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, and was a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at the, in, in the Cultures in Tra Transnational Perspective program, and a visiting assistant professor of global studies and political science at the University of California, Los Angeles. She was also awarded a Carter G. Woodson Center Predoctoral Fellowship at the University of Virginia, where she researched Mandarin language in Africa. Dr. Plummer has conducted extensive field research in, in, in China, Kenya, where I'm from, South Africa, Mozambique, Senegal. Her articles on China's engagements in Africa have also been published in the National Political Science Review, the Journal of Asian and African Studies, the African Focus Bulletin, and Foreign Policy in Focus. She's also the co-convener of uh, the Center for Africa, the Department of African Studies uh, African Studies Palava series, and is a co-convener as well of the African Studies Association Women's Caucus. In addition to her extensive academic research, she also has a passion for activism, community organizing, and international solidarity. She has coordinated seminars in South Africa, Namibia, Mozambique with students, teachers, and activists. My point is, she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> yeah. I'm also very excited to note the presence of the director of the Center for African Studies, Dr. Krista Johnson, as she's with us and her support is with us as well. It has been felt throughout the process of this, organizing this uh, panel. But without further ado, uh, Dr. Anita Plummer. Thank you so much for that very gracious introduction. Now I have to try to live up to it. <laughs> so I wanna begin by thanking Nubia Sorority International Incorporated, the Knights Fraternity Incorporated, the Chinese Culture Club and the ASGSA for inviting me to participate in this discussion. I admire the work of your organizations and it's an honor to be here also with my colleague, Dr. Myandu, who has done fascinating research on our topic for today. Finally, thank you, Renee and Anya at the Center for African Studies for your impeccable communication and coordination leading up to today. Today, I was hard to get in contact with <laughs> over the past week. And I just thank you for being so patient with me. So um, I'm gonna share my screen. So hopefully this will work out. I just have a few slides. So you all should see PowerPoint. Thumbs up if you do, if you don't, just let me know. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. So I wanna talk about this idea of a new normal in Africa. Um, Ashley rightly referenced the role of traditional Western powers in Africa, and they have a long standing legacy in terms of how they operate on the continent, collectively and individually. But things have shifted over the past two decades, right? It, it's not a new phenomenon, China's presence. So I wanna phrase or open our panel discussion on this idea of the new normal. And of course the new normal uh, applies to many areas these days, ranging from the advent of the, what the Pew Research Center calls the tele-everything, telemedicine, telework, tele-education, even to US foreign policy, entering a different era post-Trump and eventually 
the new normal in terms of our post COVID political landscape. Conceptually, the new normal signifies a major change that's unfamiliar and atypical, but because of changing circumstances becomes the standard. This afternoon, I hope we can have a discussion on the specter of China, global interdependence, and this new normal. Will this new normal continue to facilitate historically exploitative relationships between African nations, China, and the world? Or is it a new paradigm in practice emerging that counters trends of de-development and underdevelopment in Africa? China's rise and in influence in the global economy has been decades in the making. Um, it's perhaps only now that the US in particular is settling into the idea that its post-Cold War position politically, economically, and, and militarily is not even what it was five years ago. There has been a major shift, especially in the developing world and in Africa in particular, where local markets and governments themselves have already recalibrated away from the West and toward China in certain areas, which we'll discuss. Transnational flows of people, capital, technologies, and products between China and African nations have rapidly increased over the past two decades. And we're collectively grappling um, with the idea that power and influence is shifting, especially in Africa, but also in Asia and in Latin America. So to give you a snapshot of what I mean by these shifts, I was in Kenya in 2008 and at, at an outdoor jewelry market in Nairobi. The market sellers, primarily women, display locally produced curios to sell to both locals and tourists. A few years later, when I returned, the demographics of that market had changed. The market sellers had changed as merchants from China selling nearly identical products, but at lower prices entered the market. And I know Dr. Myandu has done research on this, so I'm curious to know what he thinks about these, the shifting you know, cultural production from Africa to China in terms of these artifacts. So this is not uncommon in African countries as Chinese migrants have reconfigured local economic landscapes. Local communities are narrating these encounters, confronting and redefining local markets and channels of exchange. But how are these channels facilitated? My research primarily focuses on what's happening on the street level, and I'll bring some of that into today's conversation, but I'll focus primarily on the economic policies that help facilitate the state-to-state -state engagements between China and Africa. So here's a menu, I'm not, I don't have time to go through it, but you can just glance at what I'm gonna to cover today. So a very brief overview of Africa and China. The 2006 Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, FOCAC, their third ministerial conference was held in Beijing at a critical moment in China's re-emergence in Africa. I think Ashley also mentioned rightly the long-standing ties between Africa and China. It didn't just start 20 years ago. It actually goes back to the pre-modern era. High-level representatives from 48 African nations met with senior-level Chinese officials under the maximum of friendship, peace, cooperation, and development. At the conference, China announced an elaborate package of trade schemes, foreign direct investment, infrastructural development, debt reduction and relief, low interest and interest-free loans, educational cooperation, and political consultations under the banner of, quote, sincerity, equality, and mutual benefit. That same year, China released its first Africa policy white paper, which detailed the scope of China's economic, political, and social policies for the continent. Three years after this Beijing summit in 2009, China became Africa's largest trade partner. In 2018, China's total import and export volume with Africa was US about $204 billion. To put that in perspective, that's a 200-fold increase from 1978. In terms of foreign direct investment, which I think we'll talk about during the discussion, the US has actually remained the largest investor in Africa, followed by the UK, France, and then China. But between 2005 and 2017, China invested 83 billion in Africa. Just to give you an idea of where that money is going, 40% went to investments in the mineral sector, in the metal sector, and 33% went to the energy sector. The final ma major area of economic engagement, the one that's most visible in Africa, is China's development finance, which has transformed Africa's infrastructure. Between 2000 and 2014, China funded 2,390 projects in Africa, totaling $121 billion. This development finance has led to an unsustainable high debt burden in about a dozen African countries, Kenya included, and that's the site of most of my research. 
China's economic growth has fueled the demand for resources by Chinese individuals and firms who have aggressively been pursuing them, not only in Africa, again, but also in Asia and Latin America. I think it's important that we put Africa within a perspective, a wider perspective of how China is operating in the global South. This research hasn't been done, but as students, you all may consider if you go on to um, study at the graduate level, doing a comparative study of how China operates in different regions in the global South to see if there are any differences or similarities. If there are differences, especially when it comes to Africa, then we can get at, you know, if China operates um, similarly to how the West operates in Africa versus other regions, but that's another story. So both large and small scale trade deals, aid and investment packages have often had the power of the Chinese government supporting them, unlike you know, most Western companies. The impact of these economic interventions often contravene good governance, labor and environmental standards. These same criticisms are also made of North American and European firms in Africa. The key question that reinforces the uncertainty around Afro-Chinese ties is whether an alternative African development model will emerge that's different from the Washington consensus. And if so, what will that mean for democracy and sustainable people-centered development? China has somehow created a model where capitalism and authoritarianism have functioned hand in hand. In 1978, when Deng Xiaoping launched economic reforms that included opening China up to foreign investment, the country's GDP per capita was less than half of Kenya's. By 2014, China had lifted 800 million people out of extreme poverty, and its GDP was five times higher than Kenya's. These figures provide an incomplete but telling snapshot of why African policymakers are engaging in robust discussions around China's path to development as a potential model. China's development strategies are the subject of a significant body of research in China, Africa, and the West by scholars and think tanks who debate the Chinese state and its institutions, policies, culture, and history. These debates matter in Africa where Western imposed development models have failed. China's re-emergence in Africa signifies a possibility for an alternative approach to development despite the debates and even the contradictions within the Chinese system. Xi Jinping's opening speech at the 2018 FOCAT conference began with the five no's in Africa, three of which directly addressed this idea of a Chinese development model. They were, one, no interference in African countries' pursuit of development paths that fit their national conditions, two, no interference in African countries' internal affairs, and three, no imposition of our will on African countries. But despite China's insistence that it does not impose a model on Africa, the country often sends a contradictory or confusing messages about its global rise. China's economy is the second largest in the world with, in terms of its size and scale. The Chinese state has the power to influence and alter political interactions and economic transactions of partner states. The Chinese government publicly states that it does not seek hegemony, but its actions in international organizations, its political engagements, military investments, and economic power is an expression of dominance. So enter the Belt and Road Initiative. So this is the case I really want to focus on. Launched in 2013 by President Xi Jinping, the BRI Belt and Road Initiative is comprised of massive infrastructure investments that will connect Asia with Africa and Europe. It's sometimes called the New Silk Road. These investments include land and maritime transport projects, for example, railroads, surface roads, and ports. The BRI also includes investments in energy projects, such as gas pipelines, hydropower dams, and coal plants. It also includes industrial parks, export processing zones, and tourism hubs. So imagine you know, everything that was included in the white paper in 2006 has taken on a different form. And now the primary policy driving um, China's interventions in Africa, especially um, in countries along the coast is via the Belt and Road Initiative. And I bring this up because President Biden recently said the US needs a policy similar to the BRI, which we can talk about. I haven't quite formed an opinion about it. But I'm curious to know what you all think about this. So that's why I'm bringing up the BRI because within the framework of uh, U.S. policy in Africa, the current administration has brought this up as a possible model. 
In 2015, oh, excuse me, in 2015, the Chinese government expanded the scope of BRI to include the Digital Silk Road Initiative. And um, Dr. Myandu probably has a lot to say about this <laughs> I want to hear about. These projects promote Chinese companies in the tech industry to upgrade telecommunications networks, artificial intelligence capabilities, cloud computing, e-commerce, and mobile payment systems. And this is what's tricky, surveillance technology also in recipient countries. These are surveillance technologies going to African governments. Um, so I'm curious to know um, what you all think about China's increased presence in Africa's digital and also media sectors. So this, these are the countries that currently um, have agreements with this one in particular is with Huawei and their smart cities initiatives, which we can talk about, but this is a part of the digital Silk Road. The BRI has become a centerpiece of China's foreign policy. The 65 or so countries that have signed on so far to the program, including 20 in Africa, account for 30% of the world's GDP and 75% of its energy reserves. Okay. Some 50 Chinese state-owned companies are implementing 1,700 infrastructure projects around the world currently, worth about $900 billion. China's economic growth has fueled the demand for resources um, Okay, I'm gonna skip this. I wanna mention also that China's BRI is not incompatible with the African Union's Vision 2063, which is the long-term 50-year development trajectory for Africa, and it, because it calls for investments in infrastructure and ICT among a long list of priorities. And the BRI is also aligned in some cases with country-specific development programs. So I don't want us to think that the BRI is something that China is imposing um, on African countries. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Generally, countries already have their own internal development plan. So for example, the slide shows you know, Kenya's big four agenda and then Kenya's vision 2030 um, program. And Chinese and Kenyan government officials frame the BRI as being aligned with the country's domestic development agenda. So rhetorically, this is significant because it pushes back against paternalistic ideas of donor recipient ties that tend to dominate critiques of Western donors in Africa. So the framing and the narrative um, becomes very important here. So I just wanna provide one example of BRI in Kenya, and perhaps during the discussion, we can expand on different examples. I think specificity is important when we discuss Africa and China, because even though there are trends that we see among and between countries, the national situations in each country is different. So in order to have a productive conversation about what China's engagement in Africa means for the continent, we need to look at what's happening on the ground within communities and then draw our analysis from that point. Okay, so I'm gonna talk very briefly about the LAPSET um, transport corridor. It's a large scale multi-country infrastructure plan with an estimated 70 smaller projects in total. It was launched by the governments of Kenya, South Sudan, and Ethiopia. And Uganda has also become a player in discussions um, in terms of regional oil extraction infrastructure. LAPSET is a $24.7 billion project, most of which will be located in Kenya. And it has been billed as the cornerstone for regional integration of the 160 million people of those three host nations. The LAPSAT corridor would connect with existing transport and communications infrastructure by way of the standard gauge railway, roads, and airport fiber optic cables. I'm not going to go through all of this, but you can see it's quite extensive. Um, so one of the projects uh, is a mega port located on Manda Bay, which is north of Mombasa in East Africa. So it's actually, ooh, ooh, okay, let me. <laughs> Okay, it's actually right here. You see this red dot right here. So this is a very extensive project and I visited the site of the construction project in 2019. And the contract to build this mega port, um, which the logic behind the mega port being built was the Mombasa port to itself did not have the capacity to, um, 
to manage and receive the flow of goods coming globally into East Africa. Therefore, despite its own exp expansion, uh, the logic was we need another deep water port. Also, there was there is increased competition from the port in Dar es Salaam. So the Kenyan government said, okay, there's competition here. We're not reaching capacity. Let's you know build this huge port in Mandebe. Now, in 2013, the China Communications Construction Company, one of China's largest infrastructure and engineering companies, and its largest port builder, was granted a 484 million dollar contract to build the first three berths of the port located in Mandebe. Um, the total cost of the port was estimated at $5 billion. It would include uh, cargo and container terminals, an oil terminal. Um, Kenya just recently started exporting oil. Um, and the support infrastructure would include, you know, a police station, headquarters, housing for management and security. And when completed, the deep water port there will be three times larger than the Mombasa port to itself. Um, so, the, I went in and I interviewed community members who had been challenging this port, the construction of this port. So this is a signage at the construction site. The immediate environmental and economic impacts of the port project were evident in the physical changes to the sea channels and landscapes of the area. The dredging of the Manda Bay and Mkanda Channel. So this is actually a Chinese dredger here. Um, making the, the port a deep water port, you actually have to dredge. And deep water ports are prime because of course you can create, you can put more cargo and containers on a ship that's able to um, have uh, coastal access with a deep port. Um, so this integral waterway is important for transportation and fishing in the archipelago um, of Lamu. It included the excavation of coral and sediments from the ocean floor to open the channel for these large shipping vessels. Mangrove trees were cleared for construction port facilities and sea grasses and turtle nesting areas were also devastated. This is all information that the community researched. The once clear blue waters had high turbidity because the dredger propelled mud, silt and mineral deposits into the air and then back into the ocean. So here you see uh, in this photo, this light area is air, the area that had been dredged and fishers who relied on this channel for their livelihood, pretty much they can't use it now because the water is so silty that um, the fish have moved. A boat operator stated in an interview that the once thriving fishing grounds had disappeared and the flow of tourists who formerly visited to snorkel and dive along the coral reefs in the channel had stopped. Boat operators also complained that certain areas along the channel were restricted because of dredging operations, impeding safe travel between islands and the mainland. The issue has a profound social and cultural implications for communities that emphasize connections with family and cultural sites in the area. Community groups had also expressed concern that an increase in the population of Lamu will put additional stresses on the environment. The Lopset Lamu location is estimated to bring 1.5 million people to the county. And residents fear that this will lead to more pollution, changes in land use, and, and increased demands for timber. The Lamu County Integrated Development Plan, a local government initiated analysis of economic issues in the county, stated that the proposed oil refinery, Lapset, the coal plant, and po uh, Port City will have, quote, far reaching consequences if proper environmental assessments are not done, end quote. The county government also lists climate change, water scarcity and lack of proper waste management would um, also be exacerbated with the coal plant and increase in the population. In addition to environmental concerns, people that I interviewed thought that the port would become a prime target for Al-Shabaab, which has targeted Lamu since 2008, increased Kenyan military presence in the area as a result of terrorist attacks have also created insecurity, especially among youth and fishers alike who endure harassment by authorities on a regular basis. So to sum this case up, in 2012, a group of Lamu residents filed a complaint against the attorney general and several government ministries connected to this particular project. project. They made three arguments against Lapset. The first was that the project violated the Kenyan constitution and other related laws such as environmental management and, and coordination act. The second was that the residents' rights to a healthy environment 
to earn a livelihood and access to information were violated. And then finally, the claimants argued that the local county government was excluded from the decision-making process, which also violated the Kenyan constitution. In 2018, six years later, the Kenyan High Court unanimously ruled in favor of the claimants, stating the process um, was not just. However, despite this ruling, the port project is well underway. So in 2018, the court ruling went, came down. 2019, I'm, I'm actually watching construction of the port happen. So that's just one case, right, of literally hundreds of cases uh, with the Belt and Road Initiative uh, in China, where it becomes very complex on the ground. We think, oh, infrastructure is great. But, you know, what's the process of infrastructural development? You know, who's being impacted? Who's sitting at the table? So um, as transnational trade networks continue to mature and investments in transport infrastructure via the Belt and Road Initiative make business transaction easier, we see that African traders are also working alongside Chinese merchants in the same marketplaces. So um, I'm not gonna get into this, you know, the issue of Chinese migrants in local market spaces here, but we can talk about it during the um, Q and A. Um, just to wrap it up, um, Xi Jinping has made it clear that he wants to accelerate China's quest to attain great power status by the middle of the 21st century. We can't ignore history here. And the, the last major infrastructure investments in Africa were made during the colonial era with the expansion of the British empire in particular. African nations have invested in rehabilitating colonial infrastructures and China has provided an opportunity to do so. So what does the BRI mean for Africa? The BRI clearly addresses an infrastructure deficit. It has the possibility of strengthening the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. So it has the possibility of helping with intercontinental trade. However, there is also the issue of debt which we can talk about, you know, what burden are communities taking on? Because who's paying for all this infrastructure? It's not the governments, it's on the backs of the people. And, and people understand this, people are talking about this. Um, number four, you know, what are the implications for African industrialization and the sustainability of already thriving African-based industries? Um, because China's goal here, uh, I didn't talk about it, you know, in this case is market seeking. This infrastructure helps facilitate access to African markets, right? We hear the World Bank talking about the growing middle class. We, we hear folks talking about the youth surge, the youth boom in Africa. What does this mean economically? And how are foreign powers tapping into these lucrative markets? And what does it mean for local markets? And then finally, you know, what's the potential for foreign direct investment? you know, from China and also other nations once this infrastructure is put into place. So in conclusion, China's market seeking practices implicitly favor the unimpeded flow of products to consumers. This is not exclusive to China. It is a result of globalization and this movement of transnational capital, goods and people. Reflecting on interde interdependence in this moment, I have more questions than I do answers because there's a thin line between interdependence and dependence in Africa. Leaders, especially like the narrative that they have agency and they do ha have agency to a certain extent, but that agency is moderated by the asymmetry of power. Ordinary people in Kenya and across Africa are responding to China's presence in different ways. It's complex and it's highly nuanced. People on the ground are grappling with these tensions, opportunities, and ambiguities in the local, national, and transnational encounters between themselves and China. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot for <laughs> letting me ramble on. I look forward to our discussion. You're fine. You're fine. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. Like, um, you couldn't have said any of that better. Um, I, I wanted to start off with the, the discussion questions from the organizations that, I've, that we've partnered with today. Um, the first one is uh, to both of our panelists. Uh, could you explain how loans from colonial countries have historically contributed to the status of the economy in the developing countries? And how is Africa going to benefit from the resources? You talked about the construction of like within Africa and how they're sometimes ignoring the community and the environmental impact. 
um, how will this affect Africa and how can like Africa benefit from the resources given? Do you want me to start? So I have a question about the Q&A. It's the panelists are only responding. So the three of us, okay, okay. So I can, I can talk about the loans and maybe some other folks can talk about, because that was a very long question. So, you know, this legacy of debt goes back to the colonial era, right? At the start of many African countries, in order to really jumpstart their development, they took out loans from the former colonial powers. So Kenya, for example, the, at the beginning, at the nation's founding, there were loans, you know, from the UK that helped jumpstart development. And I even put jumpstart development in air quotes because it tended to be a very narrow elite few that had access to that financing, right? So the pattern of um, dependence on loans to, to help facilitate development is not a new phenomenon. Um, it started then and uh, during the era of structural adjustment in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, we saw, you know, if I were to show you a graph of lending, you know, in Kenya and most sub-Saharan African countries, you know, it's, you know, it's pretty steady and then it spikes because the World Bank and the IMF were giving high interest loans, you know, macroeconomic restructuring was a part of that. It completely devastated <laughs> African economies because, you know, it was oriented to um, facilitate free trade, which of course, benefits powerful countries because who's creating the rules of the game here. Now, we saw a decline and that decline was linked to political movements in Africa and in the US, political movements that put demands on bilateral partners, the US, the UK, France, also on the World Bank and IMF to forgive um, um, unjust loans. And that's where the HIPAA program, the High Indebted Poor Countries program emerged. Right. Again, you know, there were a lot of conditions put on those loans, but it took social justice movements to really put a different face on the impact of lending on poor people. Right. So we know that the impacts of structural adjustment led to a decline in investments in education, a decline in civil sector, a decline in um, access to everything from uh, because industries were once nationalized and they were privatized to basic you know, water and sanitation. We saw the impacts of that. So, okay, so in the you know, mid 1990s, the World Bank IMF said that they screwed up. They actually did the studies and say, yeah, <laughs> you know, we really screwed up with these loans in the, in the structural adjustment programs. But we see an interesting trend happening again. And that is the, um, they, you look at the, um, the GDP to debt ratio, and that looks at how much a country borrows up against how much a country earns within a given year, right? So countries that are highly indebted, that ratio is off, meaning they're borrowing more money every year that they bring in from taxes, for example. And there's been some debate uh, in Sino-African discussion groups about the impact of these loans. So some argue that, hey, you know, only 10 countries are highly indebted to China. So it's not, you really can't say there's a debt trap in Africa because it's only a few countries that owe a lot of money to China. Um, but other people say, but you know, there's a trend here. You know, how are people gonna pay for these infrastructural projects? And there are a lot of debates, you know, internally within countries in terms of what is an acceptable amount of debt to take on. The United States government, we borrowed money from ourselves to pay for the COVID package, right? So every country engages in borrowing, but it's different when you're borrowing from another country versus say borrowing from yourself. China has been very responsive to these criticisms and they, and I, I hope we can talk about this today. They have decided to shift their focus from giving low interest or no interest loans to more of a Western model of what they call public-private partnerships, in which when they take on an infrastructural project, and Renee may know a little bit about this, uh, the freeway that's being built from the airport to the downtown, that's a public-private partnership where a, Chinese, a private Chinese firm 
takes on the burden of building that road, but that may mean that a toll is put up to pay for it. Right. So think about the Beltway here in D.C., right, the tolls in Northern Virginia. So China has been very, you know, sensitive to this idea of leading to a debt trap. So we'll see how this public private partnership model um, works out. And they're looking at it, you know, also as a form of um, foreign direct investment, too. So there are a lot of question marks, um, but the debt burden you know, something that governments take on, but we know that your generation and your kids' generation, they'll, they're the ones who are going to have to pay off the loans. And that's what people I know in Kenya are particularly worried about. They're like, okay, President Kenyatta is taking on these loans, all these large-scale infrastructure projects. Yeah, it looks good, but what does this mean for my kids? Are they going to have education, right? Um, so huge question mark. I'm going to end there, but um, yeah. <laughs> Would any of the other panelists like to speak on that in any way? Um, I would just like to just contribute a little bit. I think Dr. Plummer said it really well. Um, but I think the, the big question at the end of the day, like just looking at standard relations, I'd, like the bottom line is like, how do we pay for these loans? How does this impact people on the ground, right? Like long term, yes, you can say like the infrastructure, long term infrastructure will help in like market expansion, the, you know, free trade agreement that was just signed like this year or so and all that, but it's like, how do we pay for this? I think that's the biggest question. So economically, I think it does contribute, but there needs to be more like involvement of the African countries. Like in Nigeria, when I, when I lived in Nigeria, at least before coming here to school, like the, the, all the Chinese construction projects that are done by like Chinese laborers, these people didn't even have like Nigerian supervisors with them, like everything says so like, oh yes, we're bringing infrastructure to Nigeria, we're trying to build your roads, um, we are trying to build your roads and everything, but we are doing it with our laborers. We are bringing, we are importing people, not just materials, right? So it's like, is how much of an influence is that like giving people on the ground in Nigeria or in these African countries while the economic um, contribution is taking place? Um, I think that's really just the biggest part there. Thank you so much. And would Dr. Mihan, do you like to speak on this as well? You're muted. Oh, I think they've said enough. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. I may touch on it as I, I go on. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one of our next questions is, in what way does China exert its influence on Africa? And um, what are some of the conscious efforts of the African Union, including the African Union development agencies to monitor and evaluate the development processes and practices? Like you said, uh, making sure that there is equal opportunity within the market. Um, what can you all say about that? I, if I may start, maybe I think my perspective, I come from kind of a developmentalist perspective. I pretend as if I, I mean, I'm a consultant to the South African government. So that's my perspective. So what's best for an African country? So that's where, in other words, to get things done. So in other, so a kind of an essentialist but, uh, developmental uh, paradigm. It kind of uh, comes from the an essentialist African perspective. So if you are asking uh, this question, uh, if first the question might be, well, how many, how, how many uh, agreements must, it will it take to achieve something? So there must be ways of kind of following up on some of the agreements that are, that, that come, that are signed here. And I think the uh, South African government, if you were to ask me, has tried to put some mechanisms, but I think it, they're still wanting. The, I'll be happy to kind of uh, get, get uh, deeper into that, but uh, there must be ways from the South African or the African side to monitor everything that goes on with the Chinese uh, government. Just a general perspective here. Um, so the question about exerting influence, I have two concrete cases about how, even though China says they're non-hegemotic and they operate differently from the West. So a few years ago, um, there was 
an uproar in Kenya because it was discovered that fish tilapia, frozen tilapia from China was being imported and sold in local fish markets. China is the largest producer and exported of frozen, export of frozen fish globally. They've created an aquaculture industry that's, you know, bar none. So here you have Lake Victoria, you have fish stocks there, you know, fish is part and parcel of many diets <laughs> in Kenya. And people were just angry because they're like, what? You know, here we have this imposter, they called it plastic fish. President Uhuru Kenyatta made a speech and he said, oh, this plastic fish that's arrived. And I, I was surprised when he made that statement. I'm like, whoa, you know, <laughs> does he know who he's talking to here? He told his government, you know, his officials that they need to deal with this issue of the flooding of the market for, of these plastic fish. What did the government do? They banned fish imports from China. They sent letters to the 13 top fish importers in Kenya, almost all Chinese companies, and said they had to cease importing fish. Local fish sellers, um, well, fishers were happy in the area of Lake Victoria. Local fish sellers were a little upset because it turns out that the fish stocks in Lake Victoria had been declining. So practically, the supply did not meet demand. The Chinese government said, oh, okay, you're going to stop importing our fish? Hey, we're supposed to fund the next leg of the standard gauge railway. We're not going to fund it. So literally within weeks, that policy had been reversed. Why? Because there are levers of power that the Chinese state can pull. Another case was in South Africa. And this was, this was like the test case. It, I think it was around 2007. Yeah, it was a 2007. Trade unionists in South Africa were upset because um, low cost sneakers, shoes were flooding local markets. And they said, hey, you know, government, you need to restrict the number of imports coming from China because they're undermining our local industries. South African government did that. They actually put a bar trade barriers up. A year later, the South African government wanted to renew. The Chinese government said, no, 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 we'll take you to the WTO. You're impeding on our free trade. Don't you dare, <laughs> you know, um, you have to lift these barriers. So um, those are examples of how the Chinese government can exert their influence. But as Dr. Myandu said, you know, monitoring is important, but there has to be political will to do so. <laughs> if there's no political will from on the side of African governments to monitor who Shemi is working on these construction sites, putting quotas in place that say 90% of the workers have to be local, which Angola has done. Kenya has put restrictions on, um, on unskilled labor in terms of their immigration laws. Um, but we know that corruption is part of it. So the folks who study Mandarin Guangxi, this idea of friendship is another term for, you know, what this friendship in terms of the gives and takes, which is, can be very corrupt. So if government leaders are benefiting on the back end of some of these large scale deals, there's no political will to actually enforce, you know, monitoring and enforce policies that benefit the masses of people and not just a narrow elite few. So it becomes very complicated. Um, and I know there are, story, there are cases that we don't know about, but when you have these large scale packages that are being negotiated, these levers can be pulled from multiple places. In terms of the African Union, I'm not quite sure if there are monitoring mechanisms um, within the African Union. What I do know is China did um, try to negotiate with the East African community as a trade bloc in terms of tra um, um, their trade agreements, and it has stalled multiple times. So there's a, there's a question with the new um, African Free Trade Agreement, if the Chinese government is going to try to negotiate with African countries as a bloc. My opinion is that would actually give African countries more power if they're coordinating their trade ties um, with China, if they coordinate with each other. We'll see if that happens. That would probably not work in the interest of the, of the Chinese government, if, if that's the case. Okay, another question. Uh, we spoke about the, um, <clears throat> basically uh, the historical like 
presence of like other hegemonic powers and being exploitative, we wanted to know, um, is there adherence to the mission for sustainable development within these development practices between China and Africa and our hegemonic powers or the actual developing nations addressing how long this development will last and whether it will end in a struggle for independence again or if there will be just simply a release to for Africa to like completely join the, the world market. Very good question. <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> and anyone can answer that, um, any of the panelists. Okay, uh, I would say, I, I, first of all, I would like to disabuse us of this notion that there is no influence, right? In the big girl, big boy world of international relations and statecraft, you get what you need by influence. In other words, influence peddling, if, if, if I may use a simple term and be plain spoken, is part and parcel of international relations. Like our, your Econ 101 professor told you, all of us here, you know, there are no free lunches and there are no solutions, okay? Just, uh, you know, give and take, the least worst option. So if you're going from that perspective alone, that this is a, a dog eat dog world, right? No one, there's an equal opportunity of strategic imperatives for each country involved, be it Turkey, Japan, France, and so on and so forth. Then we are able to appreciate China in this nexus of strategic interest and, and these strategic interests are subjective for each country. Of course then influence peddling is going to be a part of it. In using media, using uh, in my research, using academic diplomacy amongst other things. The problem then for me, uh, or so, sorry, what I look at is this idea of relations being attenuated by this, uh, th these strategic imperatives. In other words, relations between South Af an African country and China, to what extent are they being attenuated? In other words, having undue influence uh, exerted upon them that has, is not of the doing of South Africa and China or Angola and China. So that is where I think if we look at the, this idea of uh, a, what comes out of the relations, we must first start from that perspective that uh, no one wants to do Africans for any favors. Yeah, thanks for the answer. I'll actually go for, on that, right? So like like Osman said, at the end of the day, it's a doggy fault, um, like relationship, right? So I think, how long this will last depends on how much more China wants to gain from Africa or how much more Africa needs to gain from China. So at the end of the day, um, Africa needs to like define its competitive advantage to, to the world or to China, right? Like what does it have that it can also use to leverage this policies? What does it have that it can use to leverage some of this investment or this development that China is bringing into the continent? So that's the very first thing that needs to happen. And, until we figure that out, um, I think the, the development or the investment of, by China in South Africa will continue for as long as they can keep on taking our natural resources, as long as continue, you know, benefiting their market, as long as they will continue increasing their GDP through investments in, in the continent. So I don't think like, I don't think there's a clear end to when this will happen. So as long as there's still something to benefit, it will keep on going. And on the idea of sustainability, there's also a discussion of like, can China sustain development? I think they can. Like, like Dr. Plummer mentioned earlier, China is like the second biggest GDP in the world. So I think they are that they are a big economic power that can sustain that development. But if is the development itself sustainable in the continent, I'm not so sure. So um it also depends on how we look at the world, you know, sustainable, right? Is it like sustainability of you know this, this material, is it sustainability of the money that they're using for, for this? So there are really like a lot of parts to that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think. It really end as like you know one independent of the other. As long as there's something to gain, it will keep on going. Doctor Plummer, would you like to speak on this at all? Um, I I agree. Um, I wish I had a crystal ball, <laughs> which I could predict the future. But there is one idea that I, I that's floating around in terms of mis of a mistake that the Chinese state may be making in African countries. And that is assuming that 
stability within individual African countries will remain. Democracy is very messy. We've experienced that here in our country with the previous administration and this administration. Democracy chain can really upend foreign policies. So one idea that um, I've come across is this idea that um, China is assuming that the current Kenyan administration will maintain or facilitate these ties with China. What if there's an election and the current president says, we're not gonna you know, pay back the loans. What if they push back? You know, So yeah, I think that may be one error that the Chinese government is making. And um, with that, it, I would argue that it's in the interest of the Chinese government to ensure that democracy really doesn't flourish because of the instability democracy can bring to the economic and political ties, if you know what I'm saying here. Um, so yeah, I saw a question in the chat that I thought was really good and, and I think is linked to this in terms of media, the Chinese involvement in media. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I was going to say that we're going to get to the Q&A after. Okay, great, great. Okay. We're going to begin that, so. I apologize. <laughs> we do have one more discussion question to ask before we move on to our Q&A. Um, just a question that kind of, I guess, centers uh, this a little bit more around uh, maybe the minority groups within any nation, uh, women and children, uh, in what ways are women and children included in the development initiatives, especially uh, with adherence to the UN rights of child, like the workers' rights and labor laws, sex trafficking, et cetera, or the, the, the declaration of the elimination of discrimination against women? Oh, wow. This is an excellent question. I'm not qualified to answer it uh, at maybe the 20% based on my research in China. But before I say that, I've just sent some, uh, I've just texted some things to think about that I might, I'll be happy to kind of talk about later. One is on, if you go and search for African clothes right now, you know, any type of African clothes, you'll find them on AliExpress. That is, uh, so if you're looking for even the Abada or the, the Nigerian cloth that big men in Nigeria wear, the way they go like this all the time. Uh, if, you go, if you go and look for that, now you find it in China, it's made in China. These are very crucial, critical questions to talk about. And I'll be happy to talk about that uh, provocative uh, uh, aspect later. But then I've kind of got, just sent some, uh, one of, uh, something I, I sent to a friend a while ago who asked me a question on some of these things. Uh, in, there's what we call academic diplomacy, where an African country has agreements with China to say, okay, China says, I would like a concession in this industry but the African country cannot pay for it. Let's stop right there and appreciate when we discuss debt. Money in a world where no one does you favors and no one wants to give you anything for free. So you must pay for something. An African country A does not have the money, right? It can barely, thanks to structural adjustments of 2000 and, and so on and so forth, it can barely uh, pay for interest in the World Bank IMF loan, okay? But this African country still wants its educated young people to go to China and get master's degrees in forestry so they will be able to add value. I'm talking about Cameroon here. That was the, the research. So it can add value to its Cameroonian human, human resource who will be able to then exploit the Cameroonian forest industry from within Cameroon. But there's no money. So China says, well, well in exchange for this, you can bring 50 of your students to come and study at the Beijing University for Forestry, where you can study all the way to PhD. So, okay. And so they negotiate 50 students. But well, what if Cameroon sends of the 50 students, 30 are children of ministers who have no business studying anything that has to do with forestry. So right there, before they take the journey to China, the deal is imperiled from an African lack of capacity, no goodwill or corruption. So, and the Chinese having exchanged this, they see students coming, say, great, after four years, there's an attrition rate. Some of the students that I interviewed drop out. But most importantly though, while you had asked a question about women, in these programs out of 10 students you would find maybe one to two women. 
So that was a big problem uh, that I found in this. This is an example of academic diplomacy gone awry in the area of gender representativity and in the area of meritocracy. So that's my contribution to that question, and kind of to provoke yeah. something, some thought. Ashley, I'd be curious to know who asked that question because I, I would really like to talk to them. Ashley. <laughs> Ashley, you did. Okay. Yeah. I think the question brings up also the deeper issue of the gendered nature of international relations and how it's highly gendered, how foreign policy is highly gendered. And unfortunately, you know, it's often relegated to a theoretical debate and not into the practicalities of how these ties impact women, girls, and children and marginalize people, period, in terms of ethnicity, sexuality, all of that, age, right? So there needs to be more research into this. There really does. Because what the Chinese government says is, oh, it's up to the national governments to work that out. We don't interfere. But these conversations, you know, who's at the table, but who's adversely impacted? So the case of the market sellers, I was taught, you know, the very small little anecdote, you know, it was women impacted. Because these women were crafters from across East Africa, and this is where material production, you know, uh, artistic production comes in. They were negatively impacted because now they were competing with these factory made goods, inexpensively made from China. This impacts women. You know, on the flip side, you know, the inexpensive goods imported from China. Um, allow for more space for traders to sell low-cost goods. So, I mean, we can't cut off trade from Africa, I mean, from China, because it literally is responsible for millions of jobs for traders who are selling the batteries, you know, the shoes, the housewares, on every corner of the continent, in rural areas and urban areas. But this gendered aspect, um, human trafficking is real. I interviewed folks in Nairobi who talked about sex workers from China working in brothels. There was one case, and I can't remember, it may have actually been Cameroon, in which a researcher did, looked into um, uh, the sex industry in Cameroon and East Asian women being brought. Same thing with, especially South African women working in China in the sex industry. And I, and I, and when I was in Senegal, you know, I talked to some folks and I said, you know, is it human trafficking? And that's where it becomes very tricky because human trafficking, that term comes with, it's, it's, it's broadly defined, but it's very specific, sex trafficking, human trafficking, and then legitimate sex work that's voluntary. There's thin lines, but actually it's a very under-researched area, theoretically and also practically. So I really encourage a feminist perspective when in looking at, you know, gendered form relations. It's something that we need to look at, period. Okay. Well, Jan says, addition to that, I'll say kind of like, like Dr. Plummer said, women to be involved in this. And I think it's the responsibility of these African nations to promote that, right? So generally in African nations, women are most likely like not to go to school compared to like uh, boys and men. So things of that nature, the first is to address that. So if women can come to the forefront in these nations, women, you know, go to the university to study, things like international relations, things like policy, um, that will help um, change the shape for women and children in the nation generally. So um, also I, I heard of this program recently, the Schwarzman Scholars, where, you know, people are recruited from Africa to go study in China, one of their like top institutions, um, study international, I think a master's in international relations or something like that. I can't remember the exact program. So if they could also put like a quota, like, okay, um, at least 40% should be women or something like that. I think that will also help, right? Because they are trying to bring people to China to, you know, study these things as well. So if they could put like a quota, that would definitely help. In fact, I would say an example of that too was in, in the South Africa case of this academic diplomacy initiative. Uh, and um, which was a, pro a problematic number one for me was that it was Chinese Communist Party to the ANC agreement. But uh, so, but the, so that was a number one problem. So sometimes the, the problem emanates from that, this parallel diplomacy that takes place between ruling uh, parties in African countries and the Communist Party. Ne nevertheless, the Chinese said, okay, give us 60 students and, and, and for them to come, you must, they must go through this criteria, no problem. 
But when I went to China and I was uh, doing my research, I found that, well, I found out that when the students went to China, they were tested by the Chinese. They sent 20 back because in China, they say, well, you are not qualified. You know, 20 students went back. And guess what? The contract is signed. That's sunk cost. That money doesn't come back. So those are 20 missed opportunities for developmental opportunities for South Africa to get educated people. So, so you, you, it gets wild pretty quickly when it comes to some of these uh, uh, initiatives. That's why I'm always going doubling back to this idea of African-centered, African uh, evaluation and this meritocracy that must come from the African side, you know, because Chinese are very happy to punish the Africans uh, and, and benefit from it, right? Okay, thank you to our panelists for answering these questions in such an amazing way. And thank you for giving us uh, a little bit of initiative in ourselves to ask some more questions. Uh, I see that there are a lot of questions in the chat as well from oh. the, the students. Uh, I'll, I'll hand the, the mic over to Tyler Smith who will be moderating this, this next portion of the event. Thank you so much, Ashley, and thank you so much for all the panelists that came with us here today to talk about this issue. So we're going to go right into the audience Q&A. Um, just a reminder, if anybody else has any more questions, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand. We're going to be alternating between questions in the chat and people who raise their hands throughout this Q&A session. So for the first question, um, Dr. Plummer a little, touched on it a little bit earlier. Does China's current partnerships and investment in infrastructure include media? Um, and this is a question by Stefan. And then kind of a follow-up question by Jocelyn. How does Chinese investment in media impact the narrative? Is self-censorship or intimidation an issue? Um, so um, I can speak to Kenya. So CCTV Africa's headquarters, that's the Chinese state television, is actually located in Nairobi. They built this beautiful um, um, multi-studio facility in which they broadcast you know, 24 hours a day you know, Africa-based programming, but also programming that's been interpreted. So some of the CCTV programs we would see, see here, English-based stateside. Um, so they have CCTV Africa, they have China Radio International, and then they have about two or three newspapers. Um, no, one English language newspaper, and then a Mandarin newspaper that circulates in different African countries. Um, China Radio International and the newspapers, you know, that had been happening for a long period of time. But they also have what they call media exchanges in which the Chinese government will invite um, journalists from Africa to go to China. And it's like, you know, they go on tour, they participate in workshops. So in Kenya, some of the journalists have come back and talked about their, you know, uh, experience there. You know, and it was pretty mixed, but it was clear that it was a propaganda campaign, right, <laughs> in terms of how these journalists should report on China. Luckily in Kenya, the media is, is independent and it's pretty free and pretty fair. <laughs> I can't say the same thing about say Rwanda or Ethiopia, you know, it all, that's where specificity really matters. Um, so some of the journalists came back and said, you know, they're on a propaganda campaign. I got a free trip to China, but you know, one guy said, <laughs> What, what journalist said, you know, every day the English language Chinese paper is put on my desk and I just wrap it with fish. I don't even read it, right? And it's like, whoa. Um, so there are there is a concerted campaign to influence media, but of course it's hard in areas where there's a free media. Um, and that's actually a part of China's white policy, official policy. Um, so yeah, I think, I hope that answers the question. I think it depends on the country, whether or not it's influenced. But of course, everything on CCTV Africa is very glowing of China and Africa. Thank you for that. Did, did any other panelists want to kind of come in on that question? Yeah, my, my, my contribution to that would be, I, I think, coming uh, kind of zoom out a bit and kind of look into the media space uh, in the last 30 years, 20 years, we, we, of course, we know that there's kind of been a bifurcation of narrative about Africa that African scholars have always complained about, right? The showing of the, 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 the big stomach, big swollen stomach child with snot, African narrative. 
But if you open CNN, wherever you are, that is the narrative you'd see of, of Africa, you see. And, 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 and since we're living in a time, whether you, it's a, you view it as the beginning or the end of a transition, but we are living in a time where we're moving kind of from a unipolarity to a multipolarity, a multipolar world. And this time was preceded, of course, by a bipolar world. We're moving into a time where uh, powers in the world that were here to enable money to have a say in the narrative of all things in the world, including about Africa, Turkey, Russia, China, Japan, NHK, they all have stations now because they recognize that it's an integral part of being a power in this world to be in charge of your own narrative. And Africa in this nexus is caught in the middle because the, the narrative is about Africa, but from these respective perspectives. So one, if we keep in mind that even if it's CGTN, then the Chinese one or NHK, it's still a state sponsored, okay, a television network with a certain narrative embedded in it. It's just that often sometimes in the Western world, um, if it's not BBC or you know, NHK, it's going to be kind of in private hands. So that's kind of a, a big picture perspective on that, that uh, the African countries themselves are kind of so they're under this weight of these new powers. You know what, Tyler, um, I want to say one more thing, and that is the power of social media and citizen journalism in defining this narrative. I have really used social media analytics in my research more recently because, I mean, people are reporting what they're observing at these construction sites within marketplaces. So even in areas where traditional media isn't doing the job, it's citizen journalists on microblogging, on WhatsApp, which is of course private, that are actually recording you know, the nuances there. And that's where the, and sometimes traditional media then picks it up. If there's enough traction on social media, traditional media, you know, papers, TV, African-based will pick up the story. But I mean, that's where my faith is. You know, I don't have a fatalist view of China and Africa. I actually think that it's your generation who's really going to hold African leaders accountable and who are going to spotlight, you know, the, you know, injustices where they're there, but also the po uh, possible benefits and opportunities that may come from the relationship. So please don't sleep on social media when it comes to China African narratives. <laughs> So true. And now we're going to go to a question um, from an audience member, Jia Yan Chen. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Um, yeah, sure. Thanks for uh, like, 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 thanks. Um, well, first of all, Anita, that's, that's a really good presentation. So it's very clear, concise, and gives a very good update about what's going on in the African continent. I just want to point out two things. Um, first of all, um, China's non-interference. There's an exception to China's non-interference in African countries. The exception is, let's say, you can't have diplomatic relations with Taiwan and China at the same time. I'm pointing this out is because I'm from Taiwan. And let's look at the case of Malawi. This is a bit of an area for, all to, for you all for future research. It's because back in, I guess, back in 20, 2006 or a couple of years ago, several years ago, China tells Malawi that you should break off ties with Taiwan because by breaking off ties, we can give you more money, more aid and stuff. But what happens is so Malawi went along with China, it broke off ties with Taiwan, but it has, China did not follow through on its promise. It hasn't any received any aid from China so far. So that really put Malawi in a bad situation. So therefore like China, in terms of dealing with individual African countries, um, what's the amount of aid you get from China it really depends on how strategic, how relevant you are to China's overall interest. And the second point I want to point out is um, is Senegal. Um, I'm right now updating uh, my dissertation script on Senegal. And recently they have built uh, a light rail. The car has built um, a light rail. And sadly, the country that's financing this light rail project is Auscom, is a French company. So therefore, like you sh like France, so it's, uh, so you think that was China's um, aggressive investment in Africa, they can at least help, like Senegal or some countries that or Nigeria build a night rail or a subway to ease its urban congestion. But for some reason, it hasn't done that. Done that. I don't know whether or not building more like 
public transport is is is, is uh, fits was uh, will help or fits with China's overall strategies. But um, that's but one thing for sure is like the car or Legos, they can definitely use more light rail lines to reduce the urban traffic. And also one thing about the migration crisis is that it's sad that despite the, the Chinese presence in Africa, it hasn't resolved a lot of the migration crisis because a lot of people from all over the African continent, especially West Africa, they are still desperate to go to the EU in spite of the pandemic, in spite of a high unemployment rate and a lot of uh, a lot of issues. It's, it's, it's sad that it's not really addressing this migrant problem. So one thing that um, like China who really wants to make an impact in Africa is to create opportunities, is to uh, address this migrant, migrant crisis. Did you have a question, Ms. Jia Yun Chen? Um, I, I don't have a question. I just mm -hmm. I just want to point these out. Um, this right. is like food for right. thought. Yeah, that's amazing thoughts. And thank you so much for those comments. So we're gonna go into the next question by a student named Serene. What are the common arguments against Sino-African relations? I think I can quickly start. I feel, um, you know, our professors, they have probably highlighted a lot of them throughout the conversation already. But probably the biggest one is just the fear of debt. Um, so, you know, a lot of these projects, a lot of these investments come with, you know, the, um, the charge to pay back these loans at a later date, but like, how do we pay for it? I think that's like one of the biggest challenges when looking at like um, Africa and China relations, right? So um, that's definitely the biggest. Um, I'll say another one is probably just the fear of, you know, um, materials of like less quality. So a lot of the products that we see imported from China are not the best quality, right? So it's like, so if you're bringing all this, then like you have to get a new one, maybe after one month, after two months, because the products are not of like great quality. So for me, I think those are like the two biggest um, prohibitions when we're looking at that. I, I, I'm going to, uh, may I uh, make a contribution? Yes, I love this question of quality. I now would like to bring some, uh, to highlight some of this, right? Well, earlier on, I sent you, all of you, a link, and that link goes to AliExpress. Those are all African clothes, right? Made in China. There are two lessons here for Africa. And I think, because I, I speak a lot to students, people who are ambitious, and looking at the world and seeing it where they can, you know, kind of make business, make money, make a career for themselves or name or whatever. And the Chinese, what the Chinese did was, uh, that's why you go to Target now and find Maasai looking art. The Chinese went in their university called Zhejiang Normal University. They established five institutes for studying African art. And they did what is similar to like CAD, computer aided techno, uh, CAD, computer aided design, but for African clothes, like they took computers and machine learned African patterns and reproduced them in a large scale. Now, this is scary. It's scarier if you look at it, and I have with your own eyes and see how it's made, right? So what do we learn here? People have bachelor's degrees in African art in China. How many African countries have bachelor's degrees in African art? Will your parents, your African parents, Caribbean parents, allow you to study African art so you can make money like the Chinese did? Or they just want you to be a doctor, sorry, sorry to the doctors, an engineer, so you can be, you see? The Chinese took African stuff and computerized it, made it sexy, so to speak, put a degree behind it, status and world recognition, and are selling to Africans what is theirs. Because I, I'll challenge anyone here to show me an African university that, ha, that, that studies African art in, for commercial purposes. So that's one aspect of it. And the, so using your education for your direct developmental imperatives. The second question quickly on quality. Uh, okay, it's, it's, it's all about what you can afford. All of us here are wearing very high quality clothes and most of them are from China, you see. But so in China, when you go to EU, that's where I did my research, YIWU. If any of you wants to make quick money, you should do that. Put $10,000 with your friends, buy $1,500 ticket and go over there and buy 1,000 pieces of ties. 
if you buy in the inside EU international trade mart, it's like 50 cents per tie. Economies of scale, you can already calculate. If you go outside and walk the alleys, you'll find the ties that didn't pass quality control. And you can pay 10 cents for each of those ties. So what you see as low quality Chinese goods in an African country is actually goods that were bought by a, an African or Chinese merchant in the back alleys of EU. And what you see in South Africa and Sentin are the ones that were bought from inside the building. So this idea, so China has evolved from this idea of being a, everything coming from China is kind of a Hong Kong, as South Africans like to say, or a backwater. It's all about what you can afford. Thank you so much. And we're almost out of time, but can I ask one more question just because there's so much from the chat. <laughs> um, kind of summarizing a, what a lot of audience members were asking, um, Pasako and Danielle from the audience talking about kind of US's relationship with Africa and how that kind of inter intersects with kind of China-Africa relations. Um, Danielle specifically talking about technology, right? How, is there other options for these African countries that has to do with US, right? Um, and Pasako talking about kind of could China's in influence have derived from a response of kind of America and kind of Africa relations. So could you guys touch on that, just kind of the relationship between the three countries and how they influence each other? So I would have answered this question differently um, before January, but it's shifted because the current administration has publicly look, um, stated that China is a competitor you know, and that there is competition on the ground when it comes to Africa. During the Obama administration, that would have never publicly been said, right? It was said in, <laughs> behind closed doors, but this, it, we've shifted from this idea of a coordinated, you know, policy in Africa, you know, this triangular approach, you know, the US, China, maybe Europe is in there, and Africa, to wait a second, you know, I, I'm not gonna say the new scramble, I'm not gonna say that, but um, the, the language has shifted. And that's why President Biden recently said, hey, look at all this infrastructural development, all these investments in Africa. It's gonna be a hard sell convincing US companies to invest in Africa because Africa has traditionally been viewed as a bad business address, which is very problematic you know, these stereotypes of African markets, but sometimes these stereotypes don't apply to China because the idea is that Chinese companies and individuals are more risk of, um, are, are, are willing to take more risk than US companies. So that perception has to change, but it becomes very tricky in terms of identifying the appropriate role of the US in Africa. So I, you won't hear me say, oh, we need a lot of corporate investment in Africa. I don't know if that will necessarily work for Africa, <laughs> you know? Um, I'm more of the school of thought that, you know, um, African development needs to be end endogenous. And as the United States, we owe Africa in terms of the debt burden, you know, in terms of illicit financial flows, which is another critical issue. We have European and US companies literally siphoning off billions of dollars every year from Africa due to a number of different um, trade rules and policies. So I'm really hesitant to answer that question in terms of what is the appropriate role of the US in Africa, because I'm very skeptical. Because as Dr. Miandu said, we live in a realist environment. In terms of technology, um, Danielle, you're absolutely right. The US government tried to pressure foreign governments not to adopt Huawei's, I think it's 5G technologies. And Kenya just pulled out in January. Kenya was supposed to adopt Huawei's infrastructure for 5G and they mysteriously pulled out. The question is, are US companies now gonna fill that void? Uh, we don't know, say, but maybe- South Africa, Africa went in. Say that again? South Africa just went in and okay. 5G from China. So you are seeing a diversity here. Yeah, you see? <laughs> it all depends, yeah. But the security situation is very troubling in terms of the surveillance capabilities that Huawei is giving African governments. I interviewed activists in Kenya who have been surveilled and they're convinced, um, I don't have the evidence yet, but they're convinced it was the smart city surveillance technology that gave the Kenyan government the capabilities to look at private messages, um, which has led to detainments, harassments, disappearances also of activists there. 
Thank you so much. And I know we're out of time. We're a little late. Um, and thank you all, all the audience members for dropping these questions in the chat. I'm so sorry that we couldn't get to all of them, but hopefully the panelists can drop their contact information um, so that they could reach out to them after this event. That would be amazing. I just wanted to say good job on everyone. I think this is a very commendable thing to see all these student organizations who are living in a, what a time to be alive. Like to have this, I've never seen something like this. And I've been around here for like 12 years to see these undergrad, grad students, you know, uh, put something like this together. Like what a great thing to do. So just thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, before we go to our closing statement done by Tosi, I just wanna make sure that everybody can, you know, um, the people our age, I guess in a way, um, can take the information that we have learned today and take the matter in our own hands because it's our job to hold our leaders accountable as young you, young Africans, you know, young Africans in the, in the diaspora. And it's also our job to make sure we develop Africa on our own terms. So that's all I wanted to say. Go ahead to see, and thank you everybody so much. Thank you so much, Mary. Ah, what a great, great, great discussion. Um, I'm here just taking notes, you know, just, you know, taking everything in. Um, I want to say a huge, huge thank you to the Center for African Studies, you know, for uh, giving us a platform to host this event. A huge thank you to all our panelists, Dr. Plummer, Dr. Nyandu, my bro, Shemilary. Thank you so much. You know, I learned so much um, from all of you guys. Um, a huge thank you to to the African Studies Graduate Association, uh, Nubia International Sorority Incorporated, and you know the Brothers of Nice Journey Incorporated. This was a great event. Uh, and to echo what Mary said, um, it's important for the new generation to realize and understand what role we have to play in this. You know, uh, a lot of the issues that have been stated today feed back to you know African leadership. You know, why don't you know how to negotiate with China? Africa is the only place that China is you know investing in or benefiting from you know the entire world has to deal with china so why don't we have you know qualified people negotiating on the on behalf of these you know citizens it's important for us to take that seriously and make sure that every day you know, in whatever profession in whatever career you know you're you know you're striving to uplift you know the african economy thank you so much once again everyone you know in the audience for joining the conversation all the questions in the chat all the participation i appreciate everything and please 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 you know, be on the lookout for more events, you know, from the Central African Studies, you know, NIS, KFI, and ASGSA. And let's continue the conversation. Um, if the organizations can drop their, um, you know, social media, you know, contact information in the chat, you know, so that people can connect with us, you know, and we can all continue this conversation. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy Friday and have a great weekend. Thank you.